All right, you guys. So we um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about buying and holding real estate, and then using creative financing strategies to do so. It's it's always been my goal for both myself and for all of my students to buy and hold one property a year. And so I I want to. I want to make this kind of interactive. And so when, when I say to you guys, my goal for you is to buy and hold um, real estate and try to do at least one a year. Why do I say that? What, what are the benefits of buying and holding real estate? Somebody tell me, what are the benefits? So you said it's the gift that keeps on giving? Yeah. Be, be more specific on that. Why do you say that? Uh, those rents. Huh? On the one hand, you're getting the rents. You're getting the rents. On the second hand, you're getting your tax benefits. There's tax benefits. Uh huh. And then appreciation. And, and, and then appreciation. And so the house is appreciated. Anybody else? Why do I say that? What did you say? Equity. The equity. And so the equity that comes along with that. Um, so um, through the appreciation, you're going to get equity. Does everybody understand what equity is? And so. Um, and so what's the big deal about equity? Why, 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 why should I care about equity? I'm getting cash flow. So for every property that I buy, it might start off with 500, 600, up to $1,000 a month in, in cash flow. We do have the equity, but why is that important? What's the big deal? Because you can use that equity to purchase another property. So you can use that equity to build wealth, to purchase another property. And so that that's why it's a big deal. Um, as an example, last year, I, I own a property in um, Annapolis. And so last year, before the race um, started creeping up, I refinanced and I pulled and re pulled money out of my property in Annapolis. And when you pull the money out, that's a that's not a taxable event. So I pull it out tax free and then I use that money to uh, purchase another property. To, to build wealth. And because of the interest rates was the interest rate was lower <laughs> than the interest rate I had, my payment stayed the same. My payment really didn't go up. And so that's the benefit of owning real estate. That's that's why we we look at the equity and appreciation. M many people say to me, so what about the equity? I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm just going to continue to rent the property out. You should. You should play the game. I mean, play that real estate game, and 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 build wealth with it. And and so that that's why it, that's why it's a big deal. And so that's those are some of the things that we're going to talk about. And then, um, the more properties you have, the more wealth you're building, right? And the more cash flow. Now, with that cash flow, what can you do with that? What's the big deal about cash flow? Why, why should we have that cash flow? What's the big deal? What's the big deal? Somebody yeah. tell me. Why, why is that important? Why is cash flow important? Everything above and beyond your cost is um, discretionary income. That's money to invest also. Okay. And so what can we do with that money, though? Reinvest it. You, so that cash flow, we can reinvest it. What else? We can use that money for retirement. That could be our retirement income, right? And so that we don't necessarily have to worry about like um, whether or not we're going to get Social Security. We're getting it now. Um, if you build up enough cash flow, you can you can retire sooner. Um, and so all, all of those things. And this is why we invest in real estate. We we want to number one buy the property right, the buy and hold, pay it down. Now, when I say buy the property right, pay it down, pay it off, who who's paying that property off? And who the who's huh? The tenant, the tenant is, right? The the tenant is paying that, paying that property, that principal down, and then eventually pay it off. Now, I'm a big advocate on paying properties off. Uh, only because of what I went through during the recession of 2007, 2008. Um, if I had I had 13 properties at that time. If I had, you know, some of them or all of them paid off um, and I had one paid off and then I refinanced right before the recession, I wouldn't have had to start selling off some properties. 
And so I'm an advocate for paying off properties. And then, you know, at a later date, if you need to use the equity, then you go ahead and use it. But I'd like to say um, buy the property right, pay it down, pay it off. Let the tenants do all that work for you and, and then build build your wealth that way. And that, that's what you want to do. And that's how we become wealthy. One property at a time. We want to buy one property at a time. Now, these buy and hold properties, what, what type of properties are we talking about, you guys? We're buying and holding or buying and holding residential properties. Are you guys interested in multifamily? Are you interested in commercial, Airbnb, assistant living facilities? What's what's the advantage? What's the advantage of or benefit of buying multifamily versus a residential property? Somebody tell me. More opportunity for money. You get more people that are paying monthly as opposed to just the one person. Economies of scale. Okay, so explain it. So economies of scale. So explain what that is. What's the economies of scale? Well, if you have a uh, apartment, for instance, okay, and you have them coming, coming to live in one place, you have the same plan. Have them come to live in one place. It costs you a certain amount of money, five hundred dollars. Come, come, come in, have them come in and look at uh, your your ten unit, and maybe you're paying five, maybe you're paying seven. I want you to live one, two, three places. Because everything is right there, as opposed to if you had 10 different properties, he might have to go there, there and everywhere. And that's that's gas. That's time. But with the economies of scale, you're you're you're, you're scaling that whereby everything is just right there and you can save time, you can save money, you know, all those kinds of things. And, and then also, what are the, what are some other benefits of multifamily? Um, say it's in a single family, the tenant moves out. You get no income. You got a hundred percent. You got a hundred percent vacancy. But if you have a four unit and a tenant moves out, you're still getting income from the other three. Yeah, you got seventy five percent vacancy rate. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I heard you say that um, senior living that yeah so so yeah so um senior living assistant living facilities um so what what i try to do with my properties is i try to have a, a federal government agency or not 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 federal section eight federal well section eight is federal um pay pay my rent and so all, all of my properties, all, almost all of my properties have voucher holders. And, and even with the senior living, there's many different ways that um, those, those properties can, um, those tenants can pay through um, either the federal government, the local government, um, there's a veterans program, there's a battered women program. There's a lot of different programs that will help pay your rent. And those things of what I've, I've been always interested in, um, I've had, always had kind of bad luck with what we call a market rate tenant, someone who you're renting your property out for 3000 a month. They're just, they're paying you the 3000 a month. I've, I've had bad luck with that. But um, having some type of voucher holder, I've always had great luck with that. And so most, almost all of my properties um, have voucher holders in it. That, that's just like, Guaranteed money, recession proof, pandemic proof. You um, first of the month, every single month, that money is there. And so I, I highly recommend that. I mean, there's there's a stigma that the voucher holders tear your properties up. They don't. They, they don't because they're regulated now. Section eight comes out once a year. Well, first of all, it takes in, in most municipalities, it takes at least two years just to get on the list to get a property, then they know that once they get a property, um, the Section 8 is going to come out and inspect once a year. And if the property is too bad, Section 8 will kick them out. Section 8 will always give them a list of things to do and 30 days to do those things to the house. They'll, they'll give the homeowner a list as well. But if the tenant, if they don't do it, 
and they they know this section eight kicks them out the program now they've got to start all over again and they don't want that so i don't have um, i don't have bad tenants section eight I've, I've got a number of properties in baltimore um here pg county and um, annapolis it's not always, and dc the rent is not always less than market rate sometimes it's higher than the voucher so sometimes it is higher than market rate. And then also with um, voucher holders, there's um, a full voucher where um, the whole rent is paid. And then sometimes there's a partial voucher where your tenant pays a, a certain percentage of the rent and the government pays the rest. And so I always lean towards trying to get um, a tenant that has a full voucher. So I don't have to worry about even even sometimes that portion that they're supposed to pay, they either don't pay or they pay late. So I, I, I try to tend to lean towards a full voucher holder. And so I would highly recommend to you guys in terms of building wealth for yourself, especially the real estate agents in here. If you are a real estate agent, you should have um, rental properties. You are selling you are selling real estate. That's that's what you do. It's your commodity. You're selling real estate. Some of the properties that you're selling, you should be buying for yourself, especially if you work if you work with investors. Why, why are you making them wealthy? You need to make yourself wealthy. Selling real estate is what we call active income. You sell a house, you get your commission. That's it. Investing in real estate is passive income. You buy a house, you get paid over and over again for the rest of your life, your children's life, your grandchildren's life, all them people's lives. And so that's why we invest in real estate. And then and then the goal, you guys, is one a year. That's it. One a year. Now, if you want to scale your business and go to multifamily, a lot of my real estate agents have got gone into um, Airbnbs. And, and they're in the right areas and they're making a lot of money with their Airbnbs. Um, if you want to go in that direction, I mean, I think that's good as well. All right. And so um, anything else on buy and holds? Do you guys have any questions about buy and holds areas, how to finance them, where to find them? Where do you find them? Where do you get deals from? Investment deals. Where are you guys, what do you have to do to get a deal? We talk about Buying and holding, we talk about one a year. How are you going to find that one? Where, where is that going to come from? You can go driving for dollars and looking at houses that look to be vacant or abandoned and then running and then um, getting the information, the seller's phone number. And what would you say probate? And so probate. So pro probate is good. Probate is when one passes away and the state is open at the probate office. Now, the good thing about probate is there's more equity in a probate deal than any other type of deal. Somebody tell me why. There's more equity, you make more money and have more equity with probate than any than anything else that you can do. Why do you think so? Because usually the homes are owned pretty clear when the person passes away. She, she's one of my coaching students. And so she learned that over the last couple of years. <laughs> huh? I didn't hear what you said. I said with the probate, usually when the person dies, their home is free and clear. So so 75 70 percent of the time, when a, in a state is open, eighty when a state is open, eighty percent of the time, um, there's a house in that estate. One dies owning real property. And then of those 80, 70% 70, 70 of those um, are free and clear of any mortgages. And then because they're free and clear, the personal representative or the executor of the estate, um, in most cases, are selling the properties and they're negotiating with investors. And because of that, you can get really, really good deals with probate. And so you want to market for probate. Best thing to do is, though, it's just brand yourself as a real estate investor. If you brand yourself as a real estate investor, you will get those probate opportunities. Now, um, it is public information. Um, the, 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 the executor of the estate or the personal representative 
um, their name and number and address is public information. And so you can get their, their um, contact information and contact them. Um, you can, in some cases you can email them, but you can definitely call them, text them, um, and send them a letter or a postcard. And so when you hear about people wholesaling properties and making $50,000 or $100,000, it's probably a probate deal. It's a lot of equity. The baby boomers are dying Baby boomers are the wealthiest generation. The Generation Xers are inheriting these properties. The Generation Xers are the poorest generation. And so they're not taught to take these properties and keep them. They're taking these properties and selling them. So those of you guys who are baby boomers, your children, they're not going to keep those properties. They're going to sell them. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Because it's the poorest. Why? Why? Why do I say that um, that the Generation Xers are the poorest generation? Why are they the poorest generation? Student loans. Student loans. And so they were taught to to go to school and get degrees and get master's degrees and doctorate degrees, and they have a degree in <laughs> being poor. <laughs> they, want, they want everything fast. They want everything fast. So student loans, they want everything fast. What else? Let's talk about the gen. There's some gen Xers in here. Let's talk about them. They're not. They're a generation that's not as taught the value of money and how to save because they have not been in the era of needing money and needing to save money. A lot of boomers grew up. She's absolutely right. A lot of boomers grew up with parents and people who lived during uh, the depression. The depression. Yeah. And they learned value of money. You know, a lot of exes didn't. Yeah. Their parents were a lot of ruin and spending. So all, all these reasons. Yeah, exes come up in the in the in the era of excess. Yeah. Yeah. A spoil. I mean, spoil. And, I, <laughs> and as a realtor, I can tell you, the exes they want to start with the house their parents have. Yeah. Not realizing that they they developed, and that might have been their second house or third house. So they want to start building. Oh, they don't want to start. Okay. Okay. My, my poor child. Okay. <laughs> most, most of the baby boomers spoiled the excess because of what we thought that we should have had. We're trying to give our kids that. So they probably like that. <laughs> all, all these reasons, all, all, all these are good. Um, but because of that, probate for investors is really good as as the baby boomers are passing away, because, like I said, the Gen Xers, they, they should be, in my opinion, keeping the properties and fixing them up and either moving into them or at, at the very least renting them out to continue the wealth. That's truly what's called generational wealth. But when that baby boomer passes away, the wealth just goes down the drain. I mean, wealth only lasts like three generations anyway. But um, that's how we continue the wealth. And so as, a, as the, the baby boomer, we start the process of building generational wealth by just simply being a homeowner. That, that really begins the process of being a homeowner. And so there's many people like in our like let's say dc as an example who um the baby boomers are passing away in dc now let's say you pass away and you live in petworth well even if the house needs a tremendous amount of work the house is worth a half a million dollars yeah. or six hundred thousand dollars as is that's a lot of money but guess what guess what they're doing the, the baby the baby boomers i mean the generation xers and, and instead of continuing with that wealth, they cash in out. They cash in out. Wasted them. I got all kinds of stories I could tell you guys about that. But yeah, they're they're just they're cashing out of that money. Um, but again, for investors, we take that money. But a lesson for you guys is, and a hard lesson that I had to learn for myself is whenever you um if you ever buy real estate ever never sell it never sell that real estate always own it <laughs> always keep it um what i was thinking as a young investor in my 20s was so 
I started buying houses at 23 years old. And by the time I was 28, I, I owned five properties all in D.C. Now, can you imagine that? All in D.C. many, many years ago. Well, I'll just say many years ago. <laughs> many, many years ago. <laughs> You, you, okay, I'm, I'm Michelle. <laughs> and my thought process was to sell a couple, take that money, and buy bigger houses. Well, I would sold and just never did. And so that was a big mistake. I owned in DuPont Circle, Adams Mar Morgan, Fort, Fort Lee. You guys know what Fort Lincoln is? Um, and a couple other places. And those properties now, the condo I bought in DuPont Circle, um, I bought for fifty thousand. It's easily worth about. Well, no, it was just a one-bedroom condo at Seventeenth and P. About seven, eight hundred. Now, can you imagine that? I bought it for fifty thousand dollars. Huh? And then my yeah, I lived in Adams Morgan. I graduated from college. I moved to Adams Morgan. Loved Adams Morgan, so I bought two properties in Adams Morgan, and it's the same, it's the same thing. So you buy properties and you hold on to them. At the very least, you you uh, refinance if you need some cash. Michelle? I'm going to say to Greg, I'm coming across. There are a lot of um, elderly people who are um, under gardening and conservatorship. And those, those people are selling the property. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, you know, contact the attorney to deal with them. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do that as well, but I think that's that's good advice. So as as investors, unfortunately, you know, those type of properties are good for us. So then the question is, how do we acquire these properties? Like, how, how do we acquire? We, we need money, right? And we need a lot of money. We need to have we need to have perfect credit in order to acquire these properties. Am, am I right? No. Huh? No, no. Why not? Why do you say no? Because it, because the name, the title of this of Lunch and Learn is <laughs> how to get properties with little to no money. Is that why you say no? <laughs> and and so why do you guys say no? You don't need a lot of money. You don't necessarily need a perfect credit. Why do, why do you say that? I mean, just hearing from just hearing out in general, the thought has always been that you needed to have. Um, what thirty percent put down and so forth, but but actually finding out um, that a lot of times maybe not even ten percent, maybe not even five percent do you need to put down on a house, you know. So there are options, I guess, more so now because the market. Most people don't have thirty, fifty thousand dollars just sitting around to put down on a house, but the average person may have about ten thousand dollars and so there are these programs now that make it more affordable for people to become homeowners there, there are programs to, to be homeowners is one thing so because there's first time home buyer programs that you can move into which is which is great um there is that there there is a real estate investing hack that you can purchase these properties as, as an owner occupant stay in them for a year and then um, buy another property and rent that property out. I mean, that, that's a smart strategy. The property I told you guys about in, in um, DuPont Circle is number one here on the list on page two. Um, what, what, I, what, I did, what I did with that property was um, I was 23 years old. I read in the Washington Post in the classified section that this property was for sale. I had read some chapters in, in um, uh, this, this gentleman by the name of Carlton Sheets was giving out some information. If, if you shake your head and you know who Carlton Sheets is, you're definitely a baby boomer. <laughs> you're telling on yourself. But anyway, he had a whole section on um, creative financing strategies. Now, I'm like, I'm young. I'm like, I'm just going to go for it. And so I went down, talked to the owner, and I said, look, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'd like to propose to you. I'd like to um, buy the property, but um, you keep your mortgage on the property, and um, 
I will pay you an interest only um, loan um, for five years. And then I'll, I'll pay off that. It's actually a balloon loan. I'll pay off the balloon in, in five years. And so interest only for five years. In five years, I'll, I'll pay you off. And to my surprise, it was in a depressed market. He agreed. And so um, so he became the bank for me. It was owner financing. He became the bank. I, I um, put down a really, really small um, down payment. So small, I don't even remember what it was. So maybe I didn't. And I rented the property out. I rented the property out to um, like a au pair, like a nanny from England, her, her and her friend. Um, I think they either work for the embassy or their embassy. But anyway, I rented it out for five, for those five years. Um, I had great cash flow, so I was only paying um, interest. It was an interest-only loan. And then in, in five years, I um, – what did I do? Did I sell it? I don't remember. I think I refinanced, and I paid them off, paid off that balloon loan. And so that's an example of owner financing. There, there are owner financing um, opportunities now. We're in a type of market where you can um, offer that, that, that same thing that I just offered. Now, when I say that we're in a market now where sellers are accepting um, those offers, wh why do I say that? Why do I, why do I say in the type of market that we're in now? Ready to sell. They need to move on from their house. And um, a traditional buyer may or may not be able to get a loan to pay them because interest rates are, are higher now than they were, say, a year or two ago. And so there are some sellers that will accept, you know, owner financing. Um, I mean, they're, they're doing that now, owner financing where their mortgage is going to be paid off in a year or two years or five years, whatever the agreement is, as opposed to either waiting or um, having to drop the price. Um, and so some owners are accepting that. Is, 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 the, is distressed property, really distressed property, the also market for that? Um, where yeah. If you don't think it covers the back, um, the back mortgage that they can take? I, I would say yes, but I'm going to give you another um, another strategy for that, where if they're distressed, my preference would be to do what's called a subject to. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, I know my parents, when they got their house, my, my father, they got the house through a manager on the job. So they didn't, is that the same thing? Because I'm just putting those pieces together now that they passed on. But they, I guess he got the house through his manager. So how, what is that called? I'm not sure. I don't so know. I guess she signed the lease to sign the mortgage over to him. That sounds like an assumption. So probably back then, we don't do that many assumptions now. Okay. Um, I don't think FHA even allows assumptions anymore. And, and I, don't, I don't know that VA, back in the day, they did. There, there was a where well, you could assume one's loan, a, a VA or an FHA loan. So it sounds like they assume their loan. That's what, that's what they did. All right, everybody clear on owner financing? The owner will finance the property. Everybody, anybody heard of that or experienced that? You can get the owner to be the bank. You can get the owner to be the bank and pay them monthly for X amount of years, and then you refinance, you get a loan to pay them off. I actually, I actually did that recently last year where um, I bought a house in Baltimore and for fifty thousand dollars at settlement i paid twenty five thousand dollars and i had the seller um hold a note for twenty five thousand dollars for six months that gave me time to to uh, renovate the property 
rent the property out, refinance the property, and then pay them off. So I did that doing the Burr method. I combined owner financing with what's called the Burr method to um, to acquire that property. So I, so I get, I put down twenty five thousand. Um, they held a note for me where I paid monthly for the other twenty five. Um, so I, I renovated the property, uh, rented it out, refinanced, made it more valuable, refinanced, and paid them off. Is there any benefit in having the owner convey title, or you don't worry about that? No, you absolutely do that because you want to make sure you you or or it's either that or you put some type of lien on the property. Or you can put a you could use a like a promissory note. And record that, but you want to make sure that they don't sell the property up from under you. And so that, so you, you either. My preference is just taking full ownership of the property. That's my preference, and then paying off the mortgage um, according to the contract. Did you have a question? You must answer it. So, because they end up how you was how you was able to refinance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so um, I started selling real estate. I've told this story before, but I, start, I started selling real estate um, about five or six years after uh, I started investing. And I only started selling real estate because the real estate agents that I was using, um, they were just moving too slow for me. So I said, I'm just going to go ahead and get my own license and be my own realtor so I don't have to wait on them. And so... Um, so I got my license and I actually started selling and, and I liked it. I was selling this. I was showing this property. I was living in D.C. at the time. I was showing this property in Bowie, in Bowie, Maryland, to um, to my client. And the house was it was at the end of a cul-de-sac. It was a colonial. It was four bedrooms, three and a half bathrooms, two car garage big deck and a back to a lake. And I looked at the property that I was showing them and I said a little prayer. And my prayer was, God, I, I just pray that they don't like this house. <laughs> I pray that I'm able to find them another house because this is my dream home. And all I got to say to you guys is God answers prayers yes, all the time. Yes. Well, won't he do it? Yes, he it? They didn't want the house. They wanted to be in Fort Washington. So now I'm like 31, 32 years old and I can't afford this big old house. So I said, what am I going to do? And it, it was just beautiful. It's beautiful. Ducks in the yard. So I, like, Seriously. And so I had to figure out how I could acquire the property. So here's what I did. I, um, I offered to the agent to do a lease option because I couldn't afford it at the time. I said, I want to I want to do a lease option. I'll lease it for two years and um, I want to have the option to buy. And they granted that. And in two years, I would pay off the pay off the mortgage. And so I didn't negotiate. I, I um, the market value at that time for this house was like a hundred and I think like hundred and eighty thousand. I knew it was going to appreciate, um, and I knew that I would be able to um, finance it. I'd have my finances together in two years. So I was betting on myself. I put down a deposit on on the lease option that was non refundable. So I really had to hustle. And so long story short, I did two years later, I was able to get financing and I paid them off. Um, the house had appreciated, I don't know, maybe 15, 20%. So I had a little bit of equity in the property. I bought that property um, and I kept that property for about, I don't know, about 15 years. I, I kept that property and, and it, was, it, was, it was the house I brought my, my daughter home to. And so, um, I had the option. And so if you guys heard of lease options, doing a lease option, so that's what I did. Now, I didn't put a lien on the property or anything. You don't do that on, on a lease option. Um, 
And so um, I was able to acquire that. Um, I was able to get a loan and pay them off in, in the two years. Do, do you think that worked because it was new construction? It wasn't new construction. No, it wasn't new construction. It worked because, again, um, we were in a depressed market and they couldn't sell the property. And so when we're in a market, honestly, like we're in now, where it's where um, really we're sellers, we have some sellers that are having a hard time selling their property, um, primarily because when they, they want to sell them and then go buy. And so selling for a lot of them is, is easy, but on the buy side with the interest rates um, higher, they're having a, a, a difficult time buying. And so, um, and so for me at that time, a, a lease option was just, it was just brilliant. And, um, and it worked out for me. Okay, so I guess what I'm thinking is with, um, we talk about this market, mm -hmm. the ones that, that are not being sold are also pretty high. High in price? And high in price. Yeah. And so, so um, let's just take, for example, a, a property in DC where it is, it's, it's high in price, but it's still, they're selling for, for praise value. And so let's, let's say that you, you want to live in, let's just keep using Petworth. You want to live in Petworth, really can't afford Petworth or as a strategy or, or the seller can't sell. I think as a strategy, you give them, um, Obviously, you want to offer a lot less, but but you give them what they're asking for. And then you're betting that in two years, which is a great bet, if you want to do it for two years, you could do it longer than that, that um, not only will your finances um, be able to justify paying for that, the house would have appreciated. And then you, you can offer that um, lease option in two years by the property. So it's kind of yeah and so lease options work um for people who credit is not worthy my credit wasn't worthy at that time um but it was two years later or if you don't have the the money the cash to to purchase properties um lease options works for that for that reason i didn't i didn't have i just told my father this story the same story um a couple of days ago so what what i did was i didn't even have the credit at that time so I put on the loan application. Um, they asked for the name. I put C. Gregory Bennett, and I used his social security number. His name is Cyrus. So I put C. Gregory Bennett, and 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 I got in. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna be eighty-three years old. He's just happy to be living. <laughs> What if, uh, as far as the, the lease option, what if, uh, do you have any security if the owner decides to, although you're in a leasing agreement, if they, they decide to sell? And we, I know the lease can't convey to the next owner, but do you, do, do you have like a, do, is it, I don't see how you can put a lien on a property, or do you, is it just a promissory guy? Like, what's your security that? The, the, only, the only security that you really have is that contract that lease that's that's your security and it's it's a contract and you got right. but you understand what I'm saying? even though it is it's a, even, and I'm just asking even though it's uh it's it, you have that lease and agreement with them if they decide to sell it just will convey to the next owner yeah but they they wouldn't do that typically they wouldn't it wouldn't make sense for them to do that it wouldn't make sense All right, I had a buddy of mine who called me. He had a townhouse in Fort Washington and he was having a difficult time selling the property. He had it listed by an agent um, and he had tenants that just was just out of control. They, they were market rate tenants. The tenants was tearing up his property. He tried to get them out, couldn't get them out of the, out of the property. Um, and, the, and the agent, he had an agent list the property but the tenants wouldn't let the agent um, show the property. So he gave me a call. So I went over and looked at the property. He had, he had owned the property for about 15 years. He had a ton of equity in the property. Um, 
he didn't have the money to fix the property up. I said, you've got to fix it up in order to, to sell it. He didn't have the money to, um, to fix it up. So here's, here's what I told him. I said, I said, if you can get, get the tenants out of the property and we'll wait until the listing, um, agreement expires. That's not really what happened, but I'm being recorded. So I'm not going to tell you what really record about the listing agreement. Um, but we'll wait till the listing agreement expires. I'll buy the property. And so all that happened. So we, he got rid of the agent, the tenants moved out. And I said to him, I said, there's, there's not a lot of room for you to get paid. But I said, if, if I can take over your mortgage, bring the mortgage current, and it was it was behind uh let's see five it was it was behind let's just say ten thousand dollars if i can bring the mortgage current um i'll take over the mortgage i'll give you five thousand dollars now it was either five or ten thousand dollars now um and then when you when i after i fix the property up i'm going to put it on the market you're going to come to settlement i'll give you another five or ten thousand dollars and he agreed and that's called a subject to i purchased that property subject to the existing mortgage so i kept the existing mortgage on the property i took over the payments for three months um, for that mortgage i brought a current i made the payments i paid the utilities for those three months i fixed the property up my contractors did put the property on the market and actually sold for more than what we put the property on the more on the market for. And so um, he, since he, he um, owned the property, he actually signed a listing agreement and then he actually came to settlement and signed off on the documents on the settlement statement in my um, subject to agreement. It's a contract subject to contract. It stated that he would get the first, I think, um, Ten or twenty thousand dollars, and then everything else came to my LLC, and so that's how we wrote up the, the agreement, um, and and all that happened. That's subject to. So when I first got into to selling real estate in the um, mid to late nineties, we were in a de depressed market. Interest rates, believe it or not, you guys it was like a, like well, if you got a ten percent interest rate, you were doing good back then. Um, but there was there was a shortage of um, buyers. There was a um, and so a lot of the homeowners were doing these subject twos, or back then they called them land installment contracts, um, where you could just take over their mortgage that way. And so, so this one in, in recent times, um, I took over their mortgage and I didn't have to, I didn't have to go out and get a mortgage. I kept that mortgage on the property, fixed the property up and, and, and sold it. Now, I did another one uh, a few years ago in Olney, Maryland, where I did another subject to instead of flipping that property, I held on to that property for two or three years and I rented that property out. Of course, by the time I, I sold the property, it had gained, you know, more, uh, more equity. That's a subject to any questions about subject to you guys. When you pay the mortgage. Do you pay that directly to the mortgage company or you give the money to the owner and then <laughs> how does that work? I, I absolutely pay it myself. <clears throat> but it still has they're only their name on the loan. Yeah, I mean I'm getting the statement. I'm sending that in. They're gonna have their account number. So here's the thing. I don't know if you're going in this direction, but what I'll say is um in the mortgage agreement that that is signed at settlement by the current owner. There's, there's in what's in there is called a, um, a do on sale clause. And what that do on sale clause means is at any time the mortgage company can um, call the loan, meaning they can say, we want our balance now. You could be five, six, seven, 10 years in on a 30 year mortgage. They can say, we want the whole thing now. That's calling the loan. And it's in the do on sale clause. Now, you guys might say, well, they're, they're receiving the mortgage payments from a, 
they're receiving it, the mortgage company's receiving it from a third party, from somebody else. They, they, they could initiate the due on sale clause. You guys with me? Will they? Huh? Why not? <laughs> Do you think they care about who, who they're getting their money from? Huh? So they, they would never do that. I'm um, glad. Um, is that the same as um, the land installment contract? The subject two is. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. subject two and do and land installment is the same thing. So back in the day, we called it a land installment contract. Now it's called a um, subject two. Okay, so you're trying to tell me. Yeah, you old. I'm trying to say you old. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same thing. And so of all, all the creative financing strategies, my favorite is the subject to. I want to keep that mortgage on the property. Um, I want to take over that mortgage. I want to have time to um, renovate that property. I want to make the mortgage payments. Now, here's here's the thing about all these strategies in real estate investing as a whole. The numbers still have to work. The numbers have to work. I still use the Mayo formula. I still the numbers. So in this in the with the townhouse in Fort Washington, he had enough equity so that even if even with me bringing the mortgage current and making the payments for for um, for three months, if I was to put that money on top of the mortgage balance and I used the formula, the formula still worked for me. Now, if it didn't work, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't have purchased the property. And, um, the formula is Mayo, MAO, maximum allowable offer, MAO, which is like 70% of the after repair value, 70% of ARV minus repair costs. Are these houses we're talking about, were they on the MLS? No. Well, he, the one with the townhouse, he, he put that one on the MLS with, with an agent. But um, the agent, number one, listed the property too high. And then number two, the tenants gave them a hard time about showing the property. But most of the subject twos that I buy aren't on the MLS. Any questions about subject two, you guys? And so all, all of these strategies, you guys, are a way for you guys to really start thinking about um, reaching that goal of one property a year, buying and holding. And you don't always have to um, buy these properties in a traditional way. I mean, eventually you're going to have to refinance. And so I don't want you guys walking away thinking that you can purchase all your buy and holds without actually having to go out, go out and get a loan. Eventually you're going to want to refinance, which means you're going to, you're going to need to save some money and, and sometimes if you if you do a lease option or subject to or own, owner finance, you do it for a period of time that you can get your finances straight, credit, um, saving money, wh whatever that looks like to eventually be able to use traditional financing and refinance out of that creative financing strategy. You guys with me? All right. Any questions so far? <laughs> If you were looking on the MLS and using some of these strategies, what, what are your thoughts about looking for things within their form of system? I think that's good. I think that's real good. And so it's just, so yeah, whatever that strategy is, 60 days is probably good. If a property has been on that long, they may be open to some type of creative financing strategy. And so the one that I, I prayed, like I literally prayed that my, my client didn't want it, um, that had been on the MLS. I mean, it was on the MLS. That's how I found it to show it to them. Um, but I looked at, to your point, the days on the market and it had been on for a while. And I said to myself, well, since my tenant, but since, since my client doesn't like it and I love it, you know, why don't I just offer some type of creative financing strategy? And they took it. And then two years later, I, I I got a loan and paid them off. 
All right, hard money. You guys heard of a hard money lender? Huh? You heard of it? What you guys think about hard money? They're hard to find. <laughs> What would you say, man? You have to have some money. And you couldn't get it. So, um, so there's different ways of financing properties. We, we all know you can pay cash for a property. What's the pros and cons of paying cash for a property? <clears throat> what are the pros and cons? Yeah, and then you're risking, not only that, you're risking all of your money when you're paying cash. Now, the pros of paying cash is it's faster, you get the settlement a lot quicker, and you're not paying any fees. So you're saving some money. Um, but we always want to use other people's money to build our wealth. That's the key of wealth building, using other people's money. We talk about um, a cash on cash return. And so cash on cash, if we're putting up uh, let's say we have to buy a property for three hundred thousand. That's going to sell for six hundred thousand. They, they, we're buying it for cash for three hundred thousand. Um, the return is not going to be as, in, and we sell it for six hundred. The return is not going to be as great if we finance that property. And let's say on that three hundred thousand, we put up twenty percent, which is sixty thousand. Now, wouldn't you rather put up sixty thousand and three hundred thousand to get the same result? The cash on cash return is is a lot better. And so that's what we want as real estate investors, that cash on cash return. That's what we look at, you guys. But we want to put up as the least amount of money possible, even if that money costs us money. Okay. And then we can leverage, you've got 300000 Can we leverage that 300000 over three or four other properties? And that's, that's a better way to do it. And then we're going to use either a hard money lender Hard money lender is short-term financing. The interest rates are going to be a little higher than, than traditional, but it's short-term. Um, right now, you can, who, who knows what interest rates are now on, on a hard money lender? I was going to quote 8% and 3% up front. 3% up front is called points. They pay three points up front, 3% up front, and then eight percent or ten percent for the six months and some some hard money lenders are are um, higher than that you can use a private lender and a private lender is just is, is just an individual somebody in this in this audience right here who has a 401k solo 401k just money in the bank that's a private lender and you ask them to to lend you the money um, then we have the traditional um financing that you get from a bank as a, as a real estate investor you can combine the two i purchased the property the last one i did was um on downing street northeast um i purchased the property from a wholesaler at three hundred thousand um thinking i was going to sell it for six hundred thousand so i got a hard money lender i got a hard money loan for um three for about 390 300,000 for acquisition and about $90,000 for rehab I got a loan for 390 from a hard money lender you guys with me um but I still needed money for closing costs and I needed money to get to the first draw because the banks they're going to lend me the 90,000 but they want work done first and so I needed, um, in this case, I think I needed probably somewhere around, let's just say 70,000. And so here's what I did. I got the hard money loan for 390. And then I used a private lender to, um, to finance my closing costs and to get the, um, the first draw started. So, and, and then I, um, I renovated the property I, once the property was finished, I or looked at the comps again, 
and the comps were um, 630. So I put the property on the market for 630. It became a bidding war, um, went up to 650. So I sold the property for 650. How? And and I probably made around um, close to $100,000 at the end of the day. Now I made $100,000. How much money, how much of my own money did I put into the deal? Somebody tell me, huh? I didn't put any of my own money in the deal. When, when um, I sold the property, I paid back the hard money lender and I paid back the private lender. I didn't put any of my own money in the deal. Okay. And when you do your taxes on your fees, you get a write off. Yeah. And so you, you guys hear all the time buying properties using none of your own money that you you really can't so now with the creative financing strategy i i combine the hard money lender with a private lender and put up none of my own money okay question you figured it out on your own okay i was going to ask you what you were doing now because it's on private private lender And so that's something that you guys can do. Okay. But that's if you want to sell the property. If you, it's it, so, so good point. And, and so Valerie said, that's if I want to sell or flip the property. Now I could have held the property. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. I could have held the property. Now if I wanted to hold that property. The property, let's just say it, it, it did a price for six, it's for 650. Somebody, somebody take out your calculator. So let's say it appraised for 650. I'm all in. I'm all in at um, let's just say I'm all in at four, let's just say four fifty. I'm all in at four fifty. You guys with me? So somebody put in your calculator six fifty times seventy percent. And so I could have I could have just refinanced if I want to hold the property, I could have refinanced and paid off the hard money lender, the private lender. And now I have no money, none of my own money in the deal. But what do I, but what do I have? I've got I've got the property right now. I'm renting the property out. I'm making eight, nine hundred dollars a month um, in positive cash flow. And I have two hundred thousand dollars in equity that's creative financing if i'm moving too fast because some of y'all like Dwayne is just in a tizzy look at him just look at the one he's just in a tizzy <laughs> all right last one last one you guys and so you guys i had to learn all these things and so i think this is good um education but you want to go back and look up all these things like I had to do many years ago and then be bold enough um, and aggressive enough to make these type of offers and take action. The last one is, is simply um, joint venture. Um, in that same scenario with, with the property, let's say I didn't I didn't use um, I'll give you a real life example. And so I, I I've. A, a wholesaler found this property in Brandywine and, and I bought the property. It was a great deal. I had my contractor, you guys, I had my contractor come take a look at the property to give me his estimate. My contractor looked at the property and said to me, he didn't give me an estimate. He said, I want to be your partner on this, on this property. I'm going to be your partner. I'm going to renovate this property. Um, at cost, and now I'm going to split the profits with you. He, he became my joint venture um, partner. And so I got the fine, I got, I did get the financing. We did use a private lender to pay the closing costs. He took, oh, he took care of all the expenses as it related to the, um, the renovation. And for, for me, it was a great deal because I, number one, I didn't have to put up any money. And number two, I didn't have to babysit the project. 
profit. And then I'm, I'm going to get, I'm going to split the profits. I'm happy with that because um, time is money. And so I, I don't have to run the Brandywine every day or every other day. I'm good with that. He's there every day because he has a vested interest. And so I, I did a JV with him. Um, he, he renovated the property. Um, I would go maybe once a week, once every two weeks to look at the property. And bottom line is we, we, he renovated the property. We sold it for what we thought we would sell it for. And then when the dust settled, we both made, I don't know, maybe, huh? Oh, is that what it says in there? Are <laughs> oh, you cheating? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's what we made. And I didn't have to put up any money. It was creative financing. I didn't have to go out and get a loan. And so um, I think the moral of the story is, number one, the takeaway is in order for you to truly build wealth, you've got to buy and hold real estate. And then I think, number two, there's many different ways to acquire these properties um, other than the traditional way of, of acquiring these properties. There's creative financing strategies that you can use. And so you just have to learn um, how to use them, when to use each one, and then you've got to make offers. You've got to make offers on properties and just and just know which strategy um, to use for, for each, each property. Any questions, you guys? I do. So when you are engaged in a conversation with a homeowner, what are some of the questions that you ask other than the standard six that you know of? Uh, so what comes to mind? What questions do you ask the homeowner? And so I, I want to know what what's your mortgage balance? I want to know why do you want to sell? I want to know, do you have a place to move to? Um, I want to know if you're behind in your mortgage. What else do I want to know? So how do we verify that information? And so in terms of your mortgage balance, the title company can get a payoff for, for that. Um, you can get a mortgage statement to see whether they're behind or not and, and how far behind. Um, the title company, um, and Tiffany's here to represent the title company, they can let you know if there's any liens or judgments on the property. So all, all of those things, before you purchase the property, you want to check all of those things. You don't want to purchase a property unless you've done a title search. Um, with all these strategies, you want to check all, all of these things. You want to make sure you cover yourself in that. All You want to verify all of your numbers. Um, investing in real estate, you guys, is a numbers game. It's all it's a math problem and you just have to get the math right. And you got to know, um, you know, the formulas, the percentages, all, all those kinds of things. But once you learn it, once you get the math right, when you purchase the property, you just made your money. You make your money going in. You make your money getting the deal right, getting the numbers right. And if you can get the numbers right on paper and both parties agree to it, you just you just made yourself, you know, a certain amount of money and you're building wealth for yourself when you hold that property. But you got to get the math right. And so all the numbers with the math, it has to be verified any other questions these guys look familiar are you guys familiar have you guys been here before yeah. did, did you guys win a tv no we didn't huh <laughs> y'all didn't win <laughs> oh that's right and if she won the week before and i don't know how but there's no tv here this time <laughs> y'all was here for the tv y'all can leave now <laughs> Any other questions, you guys? Um, Tiffany, you want to stand up and talk a little bit about the uh, mark? And so, with all these, with all of these um, creative financing strategies, you guys, you have to you have to use an investor friendly title company, and they have to understand um, subject twos, owner financing, lease options, wholesaling. They have to understand that, and our title company does. You want to say hi to the people? Hi, everybody. I <laughs> um, look forward to working with all of you. And for those that we have um, already been working with, we look forward to continue working with you um, more. 
Um, and as Ben said, yes, we are investor friendly. Should be coming come in front of the oh, camera. Let, 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 the, let the people and Hello, never everybody. Know. <laughs> and again, my name is Tiffany. Um, <clears throat> we do have the investor friendly um, a company here in reference to celebrate settlements, and we look forward to working with you. Um, if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to let us know. Um, and like Ben said, we are investor friendly, so we do do subject to, as he mentioned. Look at hers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. But yes, um, is there anything that you need, let us know, and we'll be happy to work with you. All right, Tiffany. All right, thank you. Justin. <laughs> so Justin from our um, mortgage company, um, he does um, investor loans, buy and hold loans. Um, the refinance that I talked about, um, his company did my refinance last year. And, and they did it in a way that when I refinanced, I didn't have to bring any money to the table on my refinance. I didn't have to pay closing costs or anything. Um, introduce yourself, Justin. Hey guys, how you doing? Hi, my yeah. name is Justin, thanks for the introduction. But yeah, we do specialize in investor friendly loans. We can close fast. Um, I'm available 24 seven. My office is right around the corner there. Um, feel my, one of the brochures is in the handout that you guys have. So if you have any questions, <clears throat> if you run into any issues or just want to bounce some ideas off me, I've been doing this a while, I'm happy to help. Okay, he'll he will be around during the lunch and learn. So look, look, you guys, um, we do have um, programs for coaching. If you're a real estate agent, here, here's what I want to say to the agents that aren't part of our brokerage: um, you can make a great living listing and selling real estate. You can make a great living, but it's not until you start investing in real estate. I, I see some of my agents right here, and they're they're investing in real estate. And so that's what you have to do. Uh, we, we do need to make a living, but we want to retire financially free. We want to build generational wealth. And so if you are a real estate agent, um, talk to me. Uh, let's talk one on one um, about what we have to offer here at, at Bennett Realty Solutions. Um, any questions, you guys? Any questions? You guys ready to do some um, creative financing? You guys ready to build wealth? Huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, we've got some sandwiches here, some chips, maybe some cookies and water. Um, stay hydrated today. It's going to be the hottest day of the summer. And thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.